The world is going through changes. Changes happening at a speed that we have never seen before. This is leading to disruption, chaos, panic, fear, hysteria, and a turbulent economy and marketplace. How do you protect your wealth in a turbulent world? How do you invest for cash flow in alternative assets to escape the rat race in times of uncertainty? How do you decentralize yourself, family, your community, your business, and your investments to become sovereign and escape the matrix? If you are looking for strategies, tactics, and techniques to escape the rat race and matrix, you are in the right place. My name is MC Lobsher, and this is Cashflow Ninja. This is Cashflow Ninja. I'm MC Lobsher. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode and spending your most valuable resource, your time, once again with me. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. That's CashflowNinja.com. We've got podcasts, we've got books, reports, and much, much more. Everything at CashflowNinja.com. And don't forget to sign up for the number one newsletter in the alternative wealth strategy and alternative asset space, the Wealth Dojo. I publish that newsletter every single week. You can subscribe to the newsletter at CashflowNinja.com forward slash subscribe. I've got a fantastic show for you today. I'm joined by Tom Wheelwright. Tom, it's great to see you. Hey, it's good to see you, MC. I've been looking forward to this conversation because uh, years ago, like everybody else, I looked at Texas and Texas is kind of like, uh, you think about Texas and you already start to cringe, right? And then I heard you say the one time, no, no, taxes are fun. Yep. And I paused for a second and I'm like, wait a second, what, what am I missing here? <laughs> um, and then you started to share your approach to tax planning. And then, of course, I read Tax Free, tax -free Wealth, which if you have not read Tom's book, Tax Free Wealth, this is going to change your life. <laughs> um, anyway, ever since then, when I started to realize I'm on the opposite side of a compound interest equation that's not very favorable towards <laughs> the business owner and the investor, I've tried to be a student of taxes and read everything awesome. that I can to it. So definitely has uh, changed my life. But can you please just share for our listeners and viewers that's not familiar um, with your philosophy and your approach, how do you see taxes and how do you approach it? Well, if, if, if I, I'm a 45 year student of the tax law and what I have discovered over the years is that the tax law is really a series of incentives. Um, primarily for business owners and investors, um, um, it's and it's not that hard. I, the reason I say one of the things that's fun to me is that if you look at the word refund, everybody likes a tax refund. Fun's right in the middle of it, so it's it's right in the middle of the word refund. So you can't say that taxes can't be fun. Um, everybody loves a good refund, and so um, but the but the tax law is really it's about six thousand pages. There's about thirty pages that tell you how much tax to pay. And uh, say, basically, one line says all income's taxable unless we say it isn't. Another, another line that says no expense is deductible unless we say it is. The rest of the tax law, like almost 6,000 pages of tax law, is devoted to reducing your taxes. It's just a roadmap. The challenge is, is that it's a code, right? They call it the Internal Revenue Code. And so it's like, it's like secret. And people are afraid of it because it's very complex in the details. So what I did with tax-free wealth, as you know, is I just simplified it. And I said, look, here's the way it really works. Think of it differently. Instead of looking at it as the enemy, look at it as your friend. Look at it as how do I do things the way the government would like me to do them? And if I do them the way the government wants me to do them, then I'll pay less tax. And so th that's the goal of, of tax-free wealth, just help you understand what facts do I have to change in my life in order to reduce my taxes? I always say, if you want to change your facts, if you want to change your tax, you have to change your facts. It's that simple. Um, because the question is never, is something deductible? The question is, how do I make it deductible? So all I, all, all, you know, my job and the job of our franchisees, for example, at uh, WealthAbility, our job is to actually, uh, understand you well enough that we can help you understand what facts you need to change and then give you a choice. 
and you may want to change your facts. You may not. You may choose to pay the tax. But the problem with most people is most people never get a choice because they don't understand how the law works. What I uh, appreciate about how you explain it, too, is that, the, the you know, we humans, regardless of where we are on the spinning ball of dirt, we fear the tax man. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of it's kind of comical of all the fears that are out there. This is the one fear that probably produces some of the most sleepless nights of, for yep. everyone out there. Um, but I like how you reframe that and said, look, the government's looking for partners because there's a ton of stuff that they're not trying, that they don't want to get involved with it or they don't want to get in that line of business. So they're putting the series of incentives in place for folks, right? No, that's exactly right. And it doesn't matter, by the way, it doesn't matter who the administration is. The, administ the, the, the administration just changes the priorities. And so they change the incentives. So the current administration put in huge incentives for, uh, electric vehicles and renewable energy, right? That's just a different incentive. Whereas uh, the interesting thing is they didn't take out the old incentives for fossil fuels, for real estate, for business, for agriculture. Those are still in there. So they just added new incentives. So it's like the government never takes away incentives. They almost always just add incentives. And uh, it's, it's, it's a little comical to me because they, you know, they keep talking about, well, we need to reduce the deficit. But we need to reduce the deficit on your nickel, not our nickel, and we need to reduce it in a way that we want, not the way you want. So it's uh, it, it, it's pretty funny. Actually, actually, I think I think it's just a game. You know, I always uh, I, I tell people y you're in the game. You might as well play to win. So uh, you know, win the game, and and it's just understanding the rules. You got to understand the rules before you can you can win the game. Yeah, it's it's so true what you just mentioned. You know, I, I've been playing Monopoly and they actually have a kid's Monopoly. I've got young children and my daughter is like five years old and I'm a seven year old son. And even in the kid's Monopoly, she realized about 20 minutes in every single time she had to pay taxes. It was really not fun. <laughs> and about the <laughs> second or the third time she looked at me and she goes, Dad, I hate paying taxes. Oh, no. So I'm like, you're very far ahead, honey, at five that you already got that. That So there's ways to then obviously uh, structure uh, through a strategy, an overall strategy right. of how you can play this game uh, and then become better and better as this game and keep learning and learning. And one of the books, I just want to share this with our listeners and viewers too, the Win Win Wealth Strategy, Seven Investments the Government Will Pay You to Make. It's another one of Tom's books. Um, in this, he actually shares seven areas where the government is providing incentives and looking to partner with uh, investments. Do you want to uh, tackle a couple of those, Tom, and just share uh, yeah, some, yeah. some of those? Let, let, let's start with a whole premise. So, yeah. so I always tell people that the three questions that your tax advisor should ask you, and by the way, if they're not asking these questions, you probably need a different tax advisor. Um, the first one is, how do you make your money? That's pretty much the subject of tax-free wealth, right? It's all about how do you make your money, um, you know, deductions, so forth. The second question, though, is what are you going to do with your money? And that's the that's the subject of the win-win wealth strategy, the seven investments, because basically what happens and this is every teenager knows this. The minute they get their first paycheck and they look down at this and they go, who the heck's this FICA person who's taking all my money out of my paycheck? I thought I was getting paid ten dollars an hour or fifteen dollars an hour. And it turns out I'm only getting, you know, 70 percent of that. Why is that? Why is who is who who's taking my money here? Well. It's your partner, your partner, the government. But we have a choice. You kind of mentioned, you, you mentioned it previously. We have a choice of what kind of partner to be. Are we going to be a silent partner like most people? 90 plus percent of the public is a silent partner with the government. And they're fine with that, by the way. The government's okay with that. Or are we going to be an active partner? And the seven investments we talk about, those are the things that you can actively partner with the government. And if you do that, they're going to contribute part of the capital to do that venture, to make that investment. And in exchange, when you make a profit, they're going to take part of the profit. They're just a, they're, they're just a partner, right? So here's the thing. You don't get to choose whether they're a partner. What you get to choose is, 
what kind of partner you are and what kind of partner they are. So you can choose how they get that money, when they get that money. We've got so much more control over our tax situation than we ever think we do, just once we understand it. So the win win wealth strategy, the, the very first investment, and this is the one everybody needs to understand, is that in any country, and by the way, in win win wealth, we, we go through charts and tables for 15 different countries, um, not just the US, 14 other countries. The very first and most important one is business. So if, if you're wondering why am I paying so much tax, the very first thing you should ask yourself is, which business, what business should I start? The government, I actually give an example in chapter two uh, on business where the government will literally pay you to start a business. In other words, the tax benefits of starting a business can be greater than the cost of starting the business. So immediately, you've, now you've got a business, you paid nothing for it, the government paid 100%, but the government's only, only going to take a portion of the money back. So they put in 100% of the capital, only get a portion of the income. You get the other, the other half or more of the income. That's a pretty good deal. And, uh, bu but business, business is always number one. And it's the pr basic premise, by the way, for um, four, uh, five of the, four of the other investments, business is the premise. So whether they're real estate or whether it's um, research and development, um, for example, business is still the premise. You have to start with a business, then you just have to go, what kind of business works best for me? And it's, it's almost that, to back to your point with the partnership is, there are so many problems and challenges out in the marketplace, which the government, no, they don't have the resources or the time or right. the desire to get involved with that. So they're looking for entrepreneurs to solve all of those problems and challenges. And therefore, in that partnership, you're positioning yourself in a very, very, uh, like, very solid position in, uh, in the partnership with the government to do that. And you get a lot well, of benefits from doing that. Well, on top of that, I mean, they're not very good at it. There, there's an example in LA right now. Um, the government uh, down there has been building um, uh, residences for homeless people. The cost has been over $600,000 per apartment unit. Wow. There's also an entrepreneur down there building residences for homeless people. Their cost is $55,000 a unit. Now, who should we have building those residences? The government at $600,000 of our taxpayer money or the, the entrepreneur who's putting in $55,000, who's they're causing $55,000 and the government's probably, probably paying $20,000 20, $20, of that, but the government's paying $20,000 of our taxpayer money to shelter those homeless people rather than $600,000 per unit for those homeless people. Why aren't, why aren't we encouraging doing more to let entrepreneurs do what they do? Because we are entrepreneurs, we're so much better at it, uh, doing what we do best than the government doing it. Yeah. And so just sticking on the business. So the, the, some of the, the other areas is technology research and development, right? And that's kind of leading, uh, and being a leader, uh, just not in the United States, but globally in the marketplace, right? If there's no incentives to keep innovation going, uh, then that kind of dies and withers away. Um, yeah, so that's yeah, a, that's a yeah, huge look at, one. Look, look at some of the countries that are um, actually better than we are when it comes to incentivizing um, innovation. France, uh, you can actually, the, the government will pay for the first two years when you have a PhD salary when you hire a PhD in research and development. Okay, in South Africa, you get 150% deduction. So if you put in $100, the government gives you a deduction for $150. Um, in Singapore, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's even more than that. Okay, so um, you've got all of these incentives around the world. And uh, we actually have a bit of a disincentive right now in the US because they require us to capitalize our research and development costs. That's a huge hit. To the to the research industry in the U.S. and I think it's hurting us. I think it's why you know you have people like Airbus um, doing so much better than Boeing. You have uh, you, you you know you have uh, so much innovation going on in other countries because they're incentivizing it more. I I do think the incentives in the for the for a large part I think the incentives do work. Yeah, 
And then obviously, uh, number three is real estate where the, the affordability of housing. I mean, it, it's been it's been a crisis for a while and it's only getting worse and worse. Well, and, and here's an history. Here's the way I look at the, the housing. So it's interesting. You know, we all everybody knows you get a tax deduction for your mortgage, right? You get you get the deduction mortgage interest, some of your taxes. Um, so if you buy a house for yourself, you get a tax deduction. But here's what here's what happens. If you buy it for somebody else, rental property, not only do you get that normal mortgage interest and all of the taxes, but in addition, you get depreciation on the building. You get the wear and tear. You don't get that on your home, on your own residence. So the way I look at it is the more generous you are, the more tax breaks you get. And uh, the more good you do for other people, the more you're helping other people um, either with their housing or with their even or with their business or producing food, producing energy, a couple of the others. Um, the more you help other people, the more tax benefits you get. Yeah, it's that buying the house for yourself, like you said, only one house versus buying 350 units of a multifamily building and providing yeah, good, or even a duplex for somebody else. Housing. You don't even have to be big. Yep, absolutely. And then uh, this is interesting too. Uh, number four is energy. Uh, wh what's going on there? That's that's an interesting well, topic let, let, of life. Here, here, this is really interesting. So we still get huge tax deductions for fossil fuel energy um, because regardless of what the administration says, they still need fossil fuel, okay? So um, that is still what runs runs the uh, world. And so there are huge tax deductions. That's actually the only uh, tax benefit where you don't have to be actively involved in order to get the tax benefit. You can be a completely passive investor and get a huge tax benefit. In other words, you could put in um, $10,000 and immediately get an $8,000 deduction, immediately. Um, it, it's it's the only it's the only place you can do that now. Solar energy credits, although, also work that way. So you don't have to be actually involved to get a solar energy credit. But here's here's another example. So you put solar panels on your house, you get a thirty percent tax credit. You put a solar you put solar panels on a rental property, you get the thirty percent tax credit and you get to depreciate 85% of the cost of those solar panels. And a good portion of that is in the very first year. So you get both the, you get both the credit and the deduction, but only if you're doing it for somebody else. If you do it for yourself, you just get the credit. Very, very interesting. And then um, agriculture, that's also kind of a, a hot topic right now. It, yeah, around agriculture the world. is actually... It, it's actually the biggest tax benefit. It, it is the number one uh, investment from a tax break standpoint because you get to deduct everything. You don't have to capitalize pretty much anything in agriculture like you do in business or uh, research or real estate, any of those. Um, e even even fossil fuels, there's some you have to capitalize, but you do that means deducted over a longer period of time. But in in agriculture, I mean. I, I've had a lot of uh, ranchers and farmers as clients over the years, and they almost never pay tax. I mean, it, the, the tax law is so favorable to them. But think about it. What's the most fundamental need we have? Food and shelter, right? Yep. So you would think those would have the best tax benefits, food and shelter, because they're, they're the biggest needs we have. And, um, and so there are huge tax benefits uh, in agriculture. And I go through a couple of examples that are really pretty interesting. One's a Christmas tree farm um, that I go through, but I've got, I've got a client uh, raising Wagyu cattle and uh, um, he's getting all sorts of tax benefits for that. Now you need to, you, you want, you want to make money, right? The yep. purpose needs to be to make money. But if, if your purpose is to make money and it's not a hobby, then you really do get all the tax benefits. And then insurance is the a number six one that you discussed too. A lot of interesting stuff there. Yeah. So 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 the last two are ones that you don't have to be in business. Um, insurance is uh, is a public policy statement, that, and particularly life insurance. Now you get a deduction for property and casualty insurance if you're in business, uh, but life insurance you don't get a deduction for it. But you don't have to pay tax on the life insurance. You can even borrow. Um, using the life insurance as collateral and you don't have to pay tax on the borrowing 
and you can invest it and you can actually deduct the interest you're paying to the insurance company while your life insurance grows in value. There's a really good example in uh, chapter seven of Win Win Wealth about um, particularly um, whole life or universal life uh, policies where you're actually growing an asset. I uh, think about it, the way I, lo I look at it, um, I had explained to me once, and this is the best explanation ever. The difference between term insurance and permanent or whole life universal is that term insurance is an expense and uh, whole life or universal life is an asset. In other words, like 98% of whole life policies uh, get paid out and less than 1% of term insurance gets paid out. So uh, that's kind of the way to look at that. Do I want an expense? Do I want an asset? Uh, but that is something anybody can do. And it's actually a nice way to save money rather than putting it in the bank um, or rather than putting it in your 401k. Uh, because in, in your 401k, it's going to get it eventually taxed. Yes, you get a deduction up front, but eventually it'll get taxed. Whereas in life insurance, it'll never get taxed um, if you do it right. So um, that that's a it's actually a very important uh, topic that most tax people don't ever talk about. Yeah, I found a foundational asset and strategy to any 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 plan. And to your point, you know, uh, one way for sure that you know which one is an asset or not, if you go to a bank and try to place a term and life insurance policy as collateral, they're going to laugh at you. You walk in there exactly. with a the whole life or with the universal life, they're going to give you, you know, a, li a lilac life insurance right. credit because it's an asset. So that's, um, that's and then right. other, the other thing that I also just wanted to touch on that you just mentioned the the tax deferring taxes versus paying them now reducing them legally now and then putting it into a vehicle such as the life insurance where it grows then tax free and can be access tax free through policy loans and then distributions later massive massive difference just right there of the ultra wealthy i would say and just yeah. the advice that everybody else is getting everybody else is getting the deferral advice defer until a later date well 35 what are we now 35 trillion dollars in debt how much longer do you want to defer this versus take care of it now when you control it and then putting it into a vehicle where you're not taxed on it later no that's true now now in fairness the seventh um investment yep. is uh is your 401k is your deferral your your qualified plan um so i i do go through and i did have a, an interesting epiphany uh, MC, while I was writing this chapter, and that is that you, it, you are actually better off. Um, you're better off deferring than not deferring um, if there's nothing else you can do. So we always look at of of all the different um, investments you can make. Yes, the last one you should be thinking about is deferral. But if that's the only one that works for you, defer. Defer is better because you get a tax benefit when you deduct at your higher rate, and when you pull it out, you get an average rate, so you get your tax brackets. And so it does end up being cheaper, and I do run those numbers in that chapter. What's interesting, what, what I like though, is I run those numbers, and then I look at, but what if you did instead of a qualified plan, you do what I call a non-qualified plan, which is, the, which is one of the other seven investments, right? And you do one of the other seven investments, and you're like four times better off um, for, and, and not just from an investment standpoint, but from a tax standpoint. Um, and of course, any taxes you save, you can reinvest. And so let's be reinvesting them. Whereas, you know, remember that on that deferral of a 401k, an IRA, a pension plan, you will eventually pay tax. The only question is how much tax. Whereas on these other, um, these other incentives, you, you can actually set it up so that you never pay tax. Another question I wanted to uh, ask too is there's a lot of ways of how you can change your facts to change your tax as you shared. And one of that is for certain luxuries. Now you have to change the entire story around it and the operations when it comes to goods such as Ferraris, boats, private jets, and so forth, where if you just go and buy that, yeah, that that's a big expense, but you turn it into a business uh, you have a charter jet company or you have a, uh, a boat that you can charter out uh, now company while you're not using it. And maybe the same with with cars, with Turo and all these other things. Now you've changed the situation around that that uh, purchase. Right. And now there are some tax advantages to that. Yeah, for sure. And I, I actually cover that in, in uh, the 
chapter nine, um, I talk about how to get the government to pay for your Ferrari. You don't actually have to use it in a business to get the government to pay for it. Um, it's really just how do you how do you invest in the first place? This is, and I give full credit to my friend, Robert Kiyosaki. He taught me this early on. Um, I've been working with him for 20, 25 years. And one of the, the early things I remember him saying is, um, always buy an asset to pay for a liability. So always buy an asset to pay for what you want. So he, he'd buy a uh, piece of real estate to pay for his Porsche, right? Well, yep. you, because of the tax benefits, you can actually, the tax benefits are so good right now that you can actually, the, the money that you earn, be, between the money you earn and the tax benefits, you can easily pay for that Ferrari, but put the money into the real estate. Don't put the money into first before you buy the Ferrari, put the money into the asset, let it buy your, your, your liability. I, I learned this. So I, I, I learned this um, a while ago. I was in Chile with Robert and we had about 600 people in the crowd and the uh, sponsor of the event was the uh, Bentley Lamborghini dealer. And to, to the right of the stage was a Bentley and to the left of the stage was a Lamborghini. So the very first day, Robert asked me, he says, teach him how to deduct a Bentley. Can you do that? So I get up there that morning and this is a two day event. First morning, I, I teach him all the rules for deducting a Bentley. And uh, at lunch, this uh, tax lawyer comes up to me from Chile, from Santiago, and he says, really interesting stuff, Tom, but you know, you can't do that here. Uh, cars are not deductible. They're a luxury. They're not deductible. I said, oh, okay, thank you. And so that evening, I'm telling Robert this story and he just looks at me and goes, hmm, interesting, okay? Next morning, before we go on stage, he turns to me and says, Tom, Today, you're going to teach them how to legally deduct a Bentley in Chile. And I said, okay. I, I always trust the process. I said, <laughs> fine, great, we'll do it. So we got up and we showed a completely different way. It's what I talk about in chapter nine. We showed how to deduct the cost of a Bentley in Chile. And uh, at the end of the program, the same tax attorney came back to me and he said, Tom, I would never have thought of doing it that way. It would absolutely work. So I, I used to think you can deduct most things, but you can deduct the cost of anything. Yep. If you do it right. Yep. Um, what's happening in the tax world of light that business owners and investors should be aware of oh. as we're in, in 2024? Because this is a dynamic environment where things are changing constantly. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that pops up and stand up or something that you're looking at? Oh, for sure. Well, well the big one, of course, is currently is solar energy. If you're not looking at solar energy, particularly if you have a business office building, if you have rental real estate, um, if you have uh, a, a farm or ranch, um, you have a gas station, convenience store, if you're not looking at renewable energy, you're missing a huge tax benefit um, that can really increase your rate of return. Um, so that's that's actually the big thing that's going on right now. Next year, though, tax laws are going to change drastically. Remember, the 2017 tax law expires next year. So this is a lot like 2010 with the Bush tax cuts. Um, they expired in 2010, and so there was massive, oh, the government was just, all they talk about is tax. Doesn't matter who's in the White House, doesn't matter who's in Congress, we're going to have tax law changes next year. Now, here's an interesting thing to note. Um, one of the big tax law changes is going to be the estate tax exclusion chances are it's going to drop in half. So that means that it, right now, very few people are subject to it. You have to make over $13 million. And if you have a spouse, then it's twice that, right? So not a lot of people have assets, um, wealth in excess of $26 million. That is the 0.01%, right? Um, next year, though, it drops probably to $6 million uh, at the end of 2025, unless they change that. Uh, the... Um, a, most of the most of the 2017 tax act changes. Now, here's an interesting thing that when you're going to the polls, you want to take taxes into consideration. If you are all about tax the rich, then there's, of course, the Democratic Party. They President Biden's been very clear. He wants a five trillion dollar tax increase. Right. He says on the rich, it doesn't actually work out that way, but that's what he's saying. Okay. 
Then you have the Republicans who want a $2 trillion tax reduction. So that's a $7 trillion swing in taxes. So I, I think it would be advisable for everybody just to understand it. I mean, I don't care how you vote, you can vote how you want to vote. Um, if you want the tax increase, vote for the tax increase. If you want the tax decrease, vote for the tax decrease. Just know that that's what's going on. They, the, both parties have been very clear. Um, uh, President Trump recently just talked about he wants to exempt tips. Um, I thought that was interesting that he wanted to exempt tips. Um, but chances are, if he says it and he's elected and the Republicans are in control, then we'll get a tip exemption. Um, that, that, you know, when, when somebody says something that's that specific, it tends to happen. Another thing that I think will ha probably happen either way is I think we'll get our bonus depreciation back in real estate. I think that's gonna come back. Um, uh, just because both parties seem in favor of that and something has to happen next year. Um, it may be limited if you make a certain amount of money, um, if the Democrats are in control, but one way or another, I think we're going to get that back. So I, I think that's a positive uh, there. But big things are on the table. 1031 exchanges. Um, that's the like kind of exchange. Um, uh, capital gains. If you sell your business for more than a million dollars um, or, you know, you sell a um, portfolio for more than a million dollars. It's, a, it's actually a very anti-business uh, idea because if you actually put all your money into an IRA, it would actually encourage people to use 401ks. Um, and be employees instead of business owners. But that would make sense because um, obviously President Biden is very much in favor of unions. He's very against business. And so you would expect him to do things that are pro-union and pro-employee and, and, and anti-business. So it's not just the fact of the tax changes, but it's actually how do they affect you and I would look at, you know, there's real estate tax changes that are being proposed. There are business tax changes being proposed. I think we'll get the research and development deduction back. I think we'll get that one and the bonus depreciation back. Um, we'll see what happens with the corporate tax rate, which affects everybody's pension plan, by the way, to say that that only, uh, that only affects rich people is ridiculous. It clearly affects everybody who's got an IRA, 401k, pension plan, any kind of investment in the stock market. So um, there are big changes next year. And there are things you need to do this year to prepare for that. And that's why I would, I would be doing a tax strategy now in preparation for whichever one happens next year. And, uh, you know, you, it's like they say, you know, you hope for the best and prepare for the worst. This is a case where that absolutely applies. You hope for the $2 trillion reduction and and you you prepare for the five trillion dollar increase yeah fantastic advice because like you said it, it, taxes need to be proactive anyway so you got six months to map this out strategize yep. and work with a tax strategist and a tax professional which brings up another question i get asked all the time and somebody's probably thinking about right now where do i find a cpa or a tax strategist that understands what Tom teaches in tax-free wealth and the win-win wealth strategy and is aligned with his philosophy and kind of how he views taxes and, and, and what he does. Um, there's been a lot of developments at WealthAbility and a fantastic network. And we've got a lot of people in our network that have found tax professionals, tax strategists, CPAs, and so forth to help them strategizing and, and with their planning uh, with regards to taxes in the WealthAbility network, what is going on uh, with WealthAbility and, well, and what are some of the latest updates? We, we've actually decided to up our game. So uh, we've decided to, to level up, if you will, and we've gone from a network to a franchise. And, and the benefit there is we have much more uh, say on how the franchisees are going to deliver their services than we did with a loose network of firms um, like we had in the past. So we'd have, you know, for the most part, people did great in the network. There were some that would fall, you know, fall down. We had no control over that because they weren't our firms. But as franchisees, they are our firms. So we have a lot more say. I, I'm actually spending pretty much every week, I'm training our franchisees. Uh, whereas with the network, it was twice a year. Um, now it's every single week. And so um, they're all entrepreneurs. Um, they, they're all, we have them at different levels from somebody who's 
you know, if you're just starting out, we'll send you to a certain franchise, a certain advisor. If you're uh, kind of uh, just, you've got an established business, we'll send you a different advisor. And if you're like a serial entrepreneur, we'll send you, send you to yet a different advisor. So we don't look at where you're located because all of our CPAs can handle um, clients all over the country. What we look at is what's your situation, what do you need, and we want to get you to the right advisor. And because we have different franchisees at different levels, we can do that. We're the, actually the only place you can go where you can get a different level advisor depending on where you are. And then at some point as you get you know, stronger and you, you get more profitable, you might add real estate or more, more, uh, more, um, more businesses to your portfolio. You can level up within our network. You don't have to go to some new CPA you can, or, or an, a new system. You can stay within our system. And I think that's a huge advantage for clients, um, business owners and real estate investors that they can actually level up within the same system, use our proprietary software um, where with, that we're constantly developing. We're putting millions of dollars into the software and uh, it's, it's doing a fantastic job for our clients. Our clients absolutely love it. And it's, uh, it, we, the, the responses we get are so good. It's like, I went to, I, I went to wealth ability, reduce my taxes and it changed my life. That's what we like to hear. And that is our goal with every single client. Fantastic. So if folks are interested in listening to this, a business owner, investor, and they're looking for, uh, in the next six months to get their ducks in a row and strategize uh, with taxes and get ahead of what is coming down the line. They can go to wealthability.com and just enter the information there. Absolutely. And they'll be partnered with, uh, with an advisor that is at their, their level that can take them also to the next level, right? There you go. Awesome. Awesome. Tom, and then um, for folks that are interested, you also have a great podcast. Uh, the books I've shared, Tax-Free Wealth, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, av available on, on Amazon and, and your website. Where are the other touch points that folks can reach out and follow? Um, so we're all over social media. So you can, any any, any social media, you can find find me, find me us and find me. Um, certainly, um, uh, YouTube is a great channel. The The podcast is The Wealth Ability Show. We also um, do a lot, a uh, lot of YouTube um, explanatory videos. Um, in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to do a new series. Uh, we have, the IRS has its dirty dozen and I have my, 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 my golden dozen, uh, which are the, the 12 best things you could be doing um, rather than the IRS looking at the 12 worst things you could be doing. So I'd, I'd like to, I always like to focus on the positive. I'm the youngest of six kids and I like the positive side. So it's tax-free wealth. It's positive. It's not negative. It's the golden dozen. It's the golden dozen, not the dirty dozen. Fantastic. Well, Tom, thank you so much again for coming on the show and sharing your insights and your knowledge and providing so much value for all of my listeners and viewers. Thanks MC. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much to all of my listeners and my viewers for, again, spending your most valuable resource, your time, once again with me on the show. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. CashflowNinja.com. And don't forget to sign up for our weekly newsletter, The Wealth Dojo. It's the number one newsletter in the alternative wealth strategy and alternative asset investing space. You can subscribe to the weekly newsletter, The Wealth Dojo, at CashflowNinja.com forward slash subscribe. Until next time, live infinitely. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.